Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala nabiya al-kareem Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Inna alhamdulillah nahmuduhu wa nasta'inu wa nasta'gfiru Wa nu'minu bihi tawakkalu alayhi wa na'udu billahi min shuroori anfusina Wa min siyyati amalina min yahdihillahu falamudillala Wa min yudlilu falahadiya la amma abad Waqad qala Allahu ta'ala fi Qur'ani al-Majid Ya ayyuhal ladhina amal one of the realities of life that everybody has to come to terms with is that life is a test and each and every one of us will be tested in different ways but there's a misconception that many of us have and that misconception is that every test will end we commonly throw around this phrase innama al usri yusra a verse of the Quran that we mistranslate as after hardship comes easy. And because of this mistranslation, we have this idea in our mind that after every difficulty, there will definitely be a period of ease. But the reality is that there are two types of tests that Allah tests us with in this world. The first are the short term tests, things that happen. They take a few days, they take a few months, they may take a few hours only. Then the test is over, life goes back to normal after difficulty can ease. But there's another type of test that everybody has to go through. And that is a test that lasts a lifetime. And if we go through these types of tests expecting after our difficulty and ease, then we are setting ourselves up for disappointment. And so what I want to focus on today is eight steps for dealing with those kinds of tests that last a lifetime. What do I mean by the kinds of tests that last a lifetime? Reality is not everybody, and not every test is going to end in our lifetime. If someone is born with a <coughs> physical condition that cannot be healed, that test will last a lifetime. <coughs> if somebody develops a chronic illness and there's no cure for it, that test is going to last a lifetime. If somebody is widowed, if somebody is orphaned, very often these tests affect you for the rest of your life. So we shouldn't be telling people that whatever you're going through in life, there is going to be ease after it. There's not always ease after it. So one of the great Sahaba who was tortured in Mecca, later on when the, when the Muslims took over Iraq and Syria, he was standing there in Syria and he was thinking about another Sahabi and he began to feel sad. And he began to feel sad. He said, that Sahabi never got to experience this. He was thinking about Mus'ab ibn Umair. Mus'ab ibn Umair converted to Islam in Makkah. And he was the person, the first person the Prophet Islam ever put on a mission to do Dawah. He sent him to Medina to do Dawah. And because of Mus'ab ibn Umair, Medina became an Islamic land. The people, the leaders of Medina converted to Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu was able to migrate to Medina. But then the Battle of Uhud takes place, and Mus'ab ibn Umair is martyred. And he does not even own enough cloths to cover his entire body. And so, 20 or 30 years later, his friend thinks about him and says, he never got to experience the ease after the hardship. He never got to experience the good times. He, was, he became a Muslim during the most difficult of times, and he was martyred during the most difficult of times. And so this is the reality of life for many people, that they will face tests, or rather each of us in different forms may face tests that will last a lifetime. How do we deal with these kinds of tests? See, a lot of the advice we give helps us to get to a short-term test. You know, we look for solutions. We, we hope for the ease to come out it. But then how do you deal with the long-term test? How do you deal with the news that you have cancer? How do you deal with the news that your father has passed away? How do you deal with the news that you will never be able to see again? How do you deal with these kinds of tests? That's what I wish to answer today. And to deal with this, I put together eight things. Eight things that each of us can do when we are tested with something that may last us the rest of our life. Number one is sober. Number one is sober. Because Allah tells us over and over again in the Quran, وَاسْتَعِينُ بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَةِ That we must seek Allah's assistance through sabr and salah. And so number one thing 
when the bad news reaches us of something that is going to affect us for the rest of our lives or even if it is something that is short term something is going to affect us for a few months or a few years whatever type of tragedy or calamity it is our number one way of responding to that should be with sober but what is sober? Sober again is something that people misunderstand. You know, sometimes someone is being abused and people tell them have sober. But that's not sober. Right? Sober means if you have a way out, you take that way out. That's part of sober. Right? What does sober mean? There's actually four translations of sober, all of which apply to different contexts. Sober means to accept Allah's decree. Right? Someone passed away and you say, Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raji'un, and you accept this as the will of Allah, that is sober. You can cry. You can feel sad, all of that's perfectly fine. That's not against sober. Sober means to work hard. You're working towards a goal, no matter how difficult it gets, you keep working towards that goal, this is sober. Sober means to control yourself. That the door is open to commit a major sin and you still hold yourself back from committing that major sin, no matter how much you want to do it, that is sober. We need to understand sober in its proper context. So in this context, what is sober? Sober in this context. The news reaches you that you have an illness or a family member has an illness or someone has passed away or something has happened and things are never going to be the same again. You say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. You say, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. And you accept the decree of Allah. And that is step number two, to accept the decree of Allah. We must understand and we must accept that Allah is in control of everything. Nothing happens in this universe except what Allah has worked. And we must believe that Allah knows what is best for us. And Allah understands what is best for us. And if something happens to us, no matter how tragic it is, in the long run, it may be what is best for us. Maybe not in this world, but maybe in the next world. Maybe somebody in this world facing calamity, and maybe they'll never walk again. And they don't see the benefit of this in, in this world at all. But maybe their sober with that calamity would be enough to get them into Jannah. And so it was the best thing for them because it got them into Jannah. And so we have to accept that Allah knows what is best for me. And with that reason we accept the qadr of Allah. If someone passes away, and this is something we're dealing with every day at the moment, if someone passes away, we have to accept the qadr of Allah. We can feel sad, we can cry, but our tongue should not utter except that which is pleasing to Allah. The third way to deal with a lifelong test is to remind ourselves every single day about the Akhirah. To remind ourselves every single day about Jannah. To remind ourselves every single day that this world is temporary. Whatever test we are going through in this world is temporary. Whether it's the pain of losing a loved one, you remind yourself, inshallah, I will be with them again in Jannah. You think about the Akhirah. If someone has lost their eyesight, inshallah, I will be able to see in Jannah. And the sights of Jannah are better than the sights of this world. If someone is chronically ill, remind yourself in Jannah there is no illness. When you get to Jannah, it's over. Remind ourselves every single day about Jannah, about the afterlife, about the Akhirah. This constant reminder helps us to cope with the difficulties of life. Whenever you feel overwhelmed, it's too much, I can't handle it. Remind yourself, Jannah awaits us. Jannah is on the other side. And there, I will not have this difficulty any longer. There, it will all be over. So it will end one day. And then there is an eternity without it. Number four is to find things to be grateful for in our lives. You see, when we're going through hard times, it's very easy to focus on what's wrong. And very often, we forget that surrounding us are many things that are right. And they go back to the verse that we mentioned in the beginning, Inna ma'al usli yusra. We often mistranslate it as after difficulty there is ease. But ma'al actually means with. With difficulty there is ease. Meaning, every single one of us is going through tests. But every single one of us also has things to be grateful for. And, you know, I learned this lesson when a family member who is going through a very difficult test, told me that you know, they're grateful for this and grateful for that. And they give a long list of things they're grateful for. And this person was very, very happy going through this list. And that person told me that someone from the generation before in our family had a similar 
calamity in their life. And that person told them, every day, look for the things in your life that you are grateful for and say Alhamdulillah for it. That's the only way to live a life that is happy. Because everybody has problems. And if we only focus on our problems, depression will set in. But if you look around at what we can be grateful for, for life itself, for Iman, for a Muslim community, for access to halal food, for our families, for whatever it is, just find the things that you are grateful for. You will learn to be happy even with your difficulties. Now, once there was a, a story of a man who visited Palestine, and this man was from the USA, and he was shocked to find the children of Palestine happy and enjoying life. And he couldn't understand why, because where he comes from, children are miserable and depressed and in counseling. So what's going on here? So he investigated and he learned that the children of Palestine look for things to be grateful for. They look for things to thank Allah for. And so they're able to enjoy life even in that calamity. While the people growing up in privileged, materialistic backgrounds look for things to complain about. They don't think about God, they don't thank God, and so they only see the negative in their lives, even though we have a thousand times more than those people who are living in poorer countries. And so my reminder to myself and each and every one of us, find things in your life to be grateful for. And thank Allah for those things every single day. You will live a happier life no matter what is going wrong. You will still be able to find moments of happiness through your gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And remember the promise of Allah, وَلَا إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ That if you are grateful, I will give you more. So if we are going through a variety of calamities, but we are still grateful for the few good things in our life, Insha'Allah, those few good things will increase. Number five, remember the promise of Allah. The closing verse of Surah Baqarah. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah will never burden a soul beyond its capacity. This verse has meant to have a very strong psychological effect on all of us. That when something goes wrong, we must remember if Allah has tested me with this, I have the capacity to pass this test. Because Allah has promised not to burden us beyond our capacity. So anything in our lives that is a test, it's there because we have within us the capability to pass it, even if we don't realize it. Even if we think we can't manage it. Even if we think it's too much. Deep down inside lies the tools to deal with it. And so this verse should make us optimistic. It should make us optimistic of the fact that if Allah has put this test in my life, then somewhere within me is the ability to deal with and to pass this test. And so we must remind ourselves whenever we feel overwhelmed by the trials of life, that Allah does not test a person beyond their capacity. So we mentioned five things to do whenever we face the difficulties of life. Have sabr, accept the qadr of Allah, remind ourselves of the akhirah, find things to be grateful for, and remind ourselves that Allah does not test us beyond our capabilities. May Allah protect us, may Allah guide us, may Allah help us to get through the tests of life and grant us ease in every area of our lives. Subhana Rabbil Iza bi Amma Yasifun, wa salamun ala mursaleen, wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillahi wahda wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da amma ba'd. فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير حدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أما بعد قال الله تعالى يا أيها النفس المطمئنة ارجع إلى ربك راضية مرضية فادخلي في عبادي وادخلي جنتي. It's a very beautiful passage at the end of Surah Fajr that we often recite, you know, when someone passes away, but it's actually meant for us to reflect on. It's something I prefer to recite every day. And that is, O soul that is in a state of inner peace, return to your Lord in a state in which He is pleased with you and you are pleased with Him. So enter amongst my righteous servants, you will be, you will enter my Jannah. This is a promise of Allah. That if we live our lives in a way that Allah is pleased with us and, he's, and, and we are pleased with Him, then we will enter Jannah. And that is the sixth thing to do when you face a trial and difficulty in this world, focus on your relationship with Allah. That is the most important relationship in our lives. Focus on strengthening your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because only Allah can help us during our darkest moments. 
Only Allah can help us through the most difficult of times. <laughs> Remember the advice of the Prophet ﷺ to his cousin Ibn Abbas. And it's beautiful that the Prophet ﷺ gave this advice to a child. Because this is what we should be teaching our children so they can cope with the test of life. When Abdullah ibn Abbas was about 9 or 10 years old, the Prophet ﷺ went for a walk with him with the, on the camel. And while they arrived in the camel, he tells Abdullah ibn Abbas to remember a few things. He says, remember Allah, Allah will remember you. Remember Allah in good times, Allah will be there for you during difficult times. Know that if all of creation gathered to harm you, and Allah has not written that for you, they will never be able to harm you. And if all of creation tries to benefit you, and Allah has written for some harm to befall you, they will not be able to stop you. The pens are lifted and the pages are dry, meaning that your qadr is already written. There's many versions of this hadith which go into more details of the advice of the Prophet ﷺ to Abdullah ibn Abbas. But the point of this is why is he teaching a 9 or 10 year old that bad things are going to happen? But if you remember Allah in good times, Allah will be there for you during the bad times. And only, the only bad things that can ever affect us are what's already written in our father. Why is he teaching this to a child? You see, we have a, a wrong philosophy of parenting in that we want to shelter our children from the test of this world. Some people don't want their children to even know that death exists. I don't know how that's working out in the current situation, but that's the thing. Some people don't want their children to know that it's a thing as death. Children have to be prepared to build their resiliency, to build their strength, to build their capability, to deal with the tests of life. You have to prepare them. And we have to prepare ourselves as well. And so this advice, although the Prophet ﷺ gave it to Abdullah ibn Abbas, it's for all of us. It's for us and for our families. Remember Allah. In good times, Allah will be there for you in difficult times. We must focus on our relationship with Allah. How do you focus on your relationship with Allah? Pray your salah properly. Recite Quran with reflection. Make dua with sincerity. Remember Allah. Contemplate on the creation of Allah. Build that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah must not just be a topic that we talk about in Aqidah, but a reality in our lives. We must feel the presence of Allah in our lives. And we can only do that if we build a strong relationship with Allah. And if we build that relationship with Allah, we can get through any difficulty. We can get through any test. Because whatever you are going through, you know Allah is there for you. Like the statement of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, when he said that if my opponents put me in prison, it's a long time with Allah. They khawa with Allah. This is the kind of relationship we should have with Allah. That no matter what goes wrong, Allah is there. And we are with Allah and Allah is with us. And this is what gets us through our difficulty. Number seven, to cope with the tests of life, surround yourself with good company. Surround yourself with people who remind you of Allah. Surround yourself with people who remind you to focus on the Akhirah. Surround yourself with people who will teach you positive things, tell you positive things, keep you optimistic. Don't be around the materialistic people who will try to make you jealous of what they have of the dunya and you do not have. Don't be around people who try to get you away from Allah, who tell you there's no point in life, there's no point in being good, life is miserable, do what you want, you only live once. Don't hang around with that kind of crowd. Hang around with the people who take you towards Allah. Because your company defines you. The Prophet وسلم, said that a man follows the religion of his closest friend, so be very careful whom you choose as your friends. And so each and every one of us should be careful that our closest companions in life are those people who bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in times of difficulty, we can rely on them and they can rely on us. And finally, finally, the main thing to do when you face a trial in life that's going to last the rest of your life, is to live the, your life for the next world. To live in this world like a stranger or a traveler, as the Prophet wasallam advised us to do. Live your life like a stranger or a traveler. What does this mean? This means that you don't attach your heart to this world. You know that everyone and everything in this world is going to end, including yourself, including your loved ones, including your most prized possessions. So your heart should not be attached to them. Your focus should be on the next world. Your focus should be on building up your good deeds. Your focus should be on doing what you can to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And 
connecting this to the first point of sabr. You know, why did Allah send us these difficulties? Why did you meet someone who's been a pious person all their life and towards the end of their life they lose their, their family members, they lose their health, they go through all kinds of difficulties. Why does this happen? Well, first remember this happened to the prophets. Prophet Ayyub is our role model in these situations. But why does it happen? It happens because Allah wants to forgive us for our sins. Remember that none of us are pious in the true sense of the word. None of us have the capabilities to get to Jannah based on the merit of our good deeds. We are by our nature sinners. This is how Allah created us. In one of the verses of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that He created mankind. So Tiana Suri Rahimullah commentating on this verse, he said that mankind is so weak that even a pious man, if a beautiful woman walks past, he forgets to lower his gaze. This is just the nature of man. We were created weak. The Prophet said, if you don't sin and ask Allah for forgiveness, then Allah would replace you with a creation that sins and asks Allah for forgiveness because Allah loves to forgive. So how do we get to Jannah? The Prophet said that nobody gets to Jannah because of their deeds. You only enter Jannah because of the mercy of Allah. Where does the mercy of Allah come from? It comes from many ways. But one of the ways that we get the mercy of Allah is when we are tested in this life and we so sober on that test. When something happens that is difficult, and we have sabr with that difficulty, that is how we get the mercy of Allah. And that difficulty can be a means of forgiveness for all of our sins, and a means of entrance into Jannah. And so someone may be struggling with a sin, and they may be trying their best to be a good Muslim, but it's just something they can't do. They're struggling to wake up for Salatul Fajr. They're struggling to give up their addiction. You know, they're struggling to dress in a way that's pleasing to Allah. They're struggling with one thing, or maybe even a few things. And then COVID hits that person. And they pass away from COVID. And Allah accepts them as a martyr. All of that is forgiven. This is Allah's mercy. Allah wants to forgive us. And these trials of life are a means of forgiveness for us. And it, it, this applies to every single trial. And I end with the hadith about the hardest trial that a person can face. And how patience with that trial enters a person to Jannah. And the same applies to every other trial that we are patient with. That they mention in the hadith that when a person's child passes away, and this is really the biggest difficulty you can deal with in this world. When a person's child passes away, Allah asks the angels, how did my servants react? And the angels say, they reacted with inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun and alhamdulillah. Allah says, in that case, build for them a house in Jannah and call it the house of praise. Build for them a house in Jannah and call it the house of praise. This is the reward for sabr with calamity. It's not easy. It's the hardest thing to deal with in this world. But when the difficulty strikes and we react with sabr and with inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un and then we find things to be grateful for in life and we still say alhamdulillah for the things we are grateful for in life, then the reward for that is Jannah. And so each and every one of us have trials in our lives. How do we get through these trials? With sabr, with trust in Allah and with hope in Allah's mercy. We look at these trials and we say inshallah this is going to be my means of earning the mercy of Allah. If I am patient with the sickness, if I am patient with his deaths, if I am patient, whatever it is, inshallah, that will be a means of forgiveness for my sins. And so we move forward, focus on the afterlife, focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, focus on his pleasure. May Allah forgive us all for our sins. May he guide us to the straight path in every matter. May he not test us except with that which we are able to handle. And may he relieve from us those tests that we are finding very difficult. ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا لا تحمل علينا إسرا كما حملت على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به وأفؤنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصر على قوم الكافرين سبحان رب العزة أما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين